Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the High Dragon's Breath. Bow wow. Coming back at you with another episode of Arkans Armory. We are getting on the way, folks. We are heading into one of my favorite topics of discussion. Medium and heavy body armor of humanity. Now, this has a wide variety of things, but I will try to keep it as short as possible because I know the next video coming out will be a long one, as the bolter will take a great amount of time both to research and to explain. So, let's jump right into it with the mythos. Now, heavy and medium body armor. There is a lot that comes with this. A lot of confusion, a lot of disambiguation to be done, and a lot of arguments and wiggle room as to what forces you can consider medium and heavily armored. Now, elite only. That is pretty much the consistent theme that you'll find is the armors that you would consider medium and heavy belong only to the most elite. I disagree with this for several reasons, but we'll get to that in a bit. Flexible means weak. Now, this is another one that comes in when people see the lower end of medium armor and say, well, that's just flak armor. That's no stronger. That isn't great protection or better protection. Just because something is flexible, for example, light carapace or synthetic armor, just because something is flexible does not mean that it's weak. Quite often it has advantages over the heavier armors in its mobility and in its coverage in many cases. So we'll get into that when we get to that synthetic, that light carapace armor. Powered versus everything. So there is another problem here because we run into forces that are very elite. Uh, not that all forces that are equipped with medium and heavy body armor are elite, but rather that many of the forces that are, are elite, and will have a bunch of specialty technical equipment and technological equipment that often requires their armor to carry a power source. This is very common with the Tempestus Scions. They will have several small power sources within their own equipment to power either pieces of their armor or pieces of their kit. However, not all medium and heavy armor has power to it. So on the one end, you'll have heavy, you'll have light power armor. Uh, just below that is what the Tempestus Scions use, and then there is a long road down until we get to the very bottom of what you can consider medium armor. And then finally, uh, related to that is everything is Scion. So once you get up to that heavy carapace, that certain standard, people just assume that it's Scions only, or that every single Scion regiment or every group of elite guardsmen are equipped to the same level as Tempestus Scions. This is rarely the case. Matter of fact, a lot of regiments that take medium or medium-high or even very high-level protection, not to mention individuals, are not at all affiliated with the Scions or the Inquisition or anything like that. Many regular guard units that just have a need for that high protection level are going to be equipped with it. Moving on. The reality of medium and heavy body armor. Here we have what I would consider one of the best comparisons between light body armor and medium body armor of the Imperial Guard. So, let's go through the list first, and then I will point off specific things in this equipment between these two gentlemen. So, kinetic versus energy weapon protection. On the lower end, on the medium armor level, the main difference between light body armor and medium body armor in terms of protection is the amount of area that is being protected. So, let's get into our comparison here. Assuming that this gentleman has lost his helmet for whatever reason, uh, which is a fair assumption, they both have similar protection for their heads. Uh, this gentleman has a pair of goggles that, uh, if you'll look into the Kazarkin models, are designed to fit into or to integrate with his helm and an integrated respirator for his face, which he's actually wearing around his neck, giving even more proof that he has a helmet that he's just not wearing at the moment, a three-piece helmet, which is characteristic of something called heavy flak armor. Now, why do I call it heavy flak armor? Is it any thicker? No, but it is that max level of flak armor that has an outer covering of ceramite or steel. Uh, it's thicker, it's rigid, it's in plates, and as you can see, whereas our standard Imperial Guardsman here has shoulder plates, 
breastplate, other shoulder plate, back plate, and a helmet are gentlemen over here in what I would consider the lower level or the medium tier of Imperial Protection has armored gauntlets. He has an armored groin and waist protector. In addition, he has side flaps here. These are all plates of armor around his waist, protecting his groin, protecting his intestines. Uh, his flak plate has a little bit of a protrusion, uh, and it is also larger, covering more of his torso. His shoulder pads are almost double the thickness of the standard, and look at his legs. Thigh protection, knee protection, shin protection. From the front, this Imperial Guardsman only has a couple of weak points, which is a very small band at his waist, his upper thigh, and his elbows. That is considerably more protection than this gentleman, who is vulnerable to enemy infantry weapons, essentially from the bottom of his breastplate to the tops of his shins, and from his shoulders to his hands. Not to mention that he isn't provided with any protection for his neck uh, or his face, which this gentleman is. So, you will also notice that he has a power pack for his hell gun, which will be something that we get into when we get into, uh, you know, every system being powered. But, in terms of sheer protection, we'll go over the difference between what is medium and what is heavy, but for the moment, consider medium to be less of a increase in protection, you know, per se. Granted, there are areas like the chest or the shoulders where they are thicker and heavier than the standard, but the real kicker with what I call heavy flak armor really isn't that it's all that much heavier, it is in some cases, uh, but it is really that it covers more of your body. It will always cover, bare minimum, it will always cover your waist, thighs, and lower body, essentially. And that comes into play later as to, you know, where you don't want to get hit. But whereas normal uh, light Imperial body armor will protect the heart, lungs, and center of chest, you know, center of mass protection, uh, as well as the shoulders, which will also, you know, in a combat stance with your arms up, the theory is that it will also protect your neck slightly, uh, but mainly it just protects you from getting shot in the chest through your arm. Uh, the uh, the medium protection, which I call heavy carapace, I know the terms are very confusing, I'm trying to keep them clear, but heavy, uh, sorry, heavy flak, which covers almost the whole body, as opposed to light flak, which just covers the torso, and not even all of that. Uh, for kinetic weapons, again, this lighter armor, uh, in no matter what variety, it's just going to provide you, you know, a chance that it'll save your life, a pretty good chance, you know, it will get hit, It'll weaken it, uh, possibly damage you underneath it if it's a strong enough round or fired from close enough. Uh, energy weapons is the same thing. These are, especially with the uh, the heavy flak armor, it will be that carapace coated, uh, that ceramite coated armor that is designed to take las bolt hits. Uh, and to take bullet hits and shatter their impact or reduce their energy so that the thick flak behind the armor and the flak weave of your uniform can then prevent you from being harmed. Uh, again, slight difference in kinetic or energy weapons as to how effective they are against uh, this armor, but really medium armor is that first level of you have a little bit more confidence that you're not going to get shot somewhere that your armor isn't covering. You know, you have mostly, uh, most parts of your body are covered with protection that can stop standard infantry weapons. So that is a great confidence booster for a lot of Imperial Guardsmen, and you'll see why that matters in a bit. Uh, affordability and modularity. This is a little bit harder. Obviously, the medium level, that heavy flak armor, uh, is going to be only a little bit sh uh, more expensive, say like two times as expensive as the standard flak armor, because what it really is is slightly thicker plates that cover your whole body. So it's just more plates on one soldier, you know, roughly doubling or maybe a little bit over doubling uh, the standard cost of an infantryman, uh, his protection. You know, not including the helmet and the goggles, which might not technically be part of the armor per se, because, um, you know, certain regiments use specialized helmets with, you know, auspex or heads-up displays, but don't wear uh, full flak or heavy flak armor. Uh, the other thing is modularity. For example, you can see that all of these pieces of his heavy flak armor are separate. They're able to move and joint and technically be removed or replaced with relative ease. You know, unscrewing a couple of things, unbolting it, pulling it off of its webbing, uh, or screwing it back on, or popping it off, popping it on. 
Now, I would assume it's probably a little, bit, a, little, a little bit more complex than that. They probably are like straps and systems of webbing that are designed to, you know, mount these pieces of armor. But still, as opposed to a lot of other heavier armors, like heavy carapace, which needs to have certain standards maintained in terms of what plates are covering where and what undercovering is underpinning the whole uh, thing, you can slap on and rip off pieces of heavy flak uh, with relative ease. And that gives it a lot of modularity. If you need to have more mobility, say in your fingers or in your hands, you could ditch the gauntlets. Uh, if you thought that you'd be getting into a lot of fights where you're going to have protection for your lower legs, but you're going to be running a lot, you might want to pop and lose the knees or lose the shins or lose the thighs. Uh, in theory, you could strip all the way back down to just having the protection of a t-shirt, uh, or rather of a set of flak armor, but it's a little bit thicker. Obviously, you can see his chest armor and shoulder is more bulky. Uh, weight standards and replacement. Even this, you know, light, even this heavy flak armor isn't all that terrible in terms of weight. It is heavier, it is bulkier. Uh, standard is, as I said, just in line with usual flak armor. Some parts are stronger, some parts are about the same. Uh, but the main goal of the medium armor is to protect your whole body. Uh, weight. It's going to be about the same. It's definitely going to slow a soldier down if they're equipped with this in full. But unlike heavy carapace, it isn't going to heavily impact their movement all that much. Because uh, it is still, at the end of the day, just Kevlar coated in a thermally or kinetically resistant material. That's really it. Uh, so it is still, you know, just bulky cloth armor that's been layered with Kevlar and then put over your uniform. Uh, replacement. One of the great things about modularity is that you can remove pieces of the armor that have been damaged, uh, and unlike the flak jacket or the flak armor of the Imperial Guard, uh, the whole breastplate, you know, that might need replacing in and of itself, but with the heavy flak armor, you have lots of different pieces. So if your leg gets hit, you don't have to turn in your whole set of pants, essentially. You're, you know, all six plates. You just pop one plate off, say, here, Quartermaster, I need a left leg upper thigh plate for my Mark 7, you know, Cadian standard heavy flak. And he'll be like, all right, cool, let me dig out the pattern for that. Yeah, this is good. Take this, pop that back onto your armor. You're good. Whereas, you know, with the single-piece lighter flak armor, it's harder to repair uh, because it's thinner and it takes more damage when it gets impacted, uh, but mainly because it's all of one piece. So you couldn't do much more than like, oh, well, my shoulder got hit. Let me pop the shoulder off. Uh, but if your chest gets hit with either of these armors, you're still going to have to pop it off and be like, all right, yep, take this, fix it, give me another breastplate. Um, but uh, that is all to say, sorry, that is all to say that the medium armor has lots more pieces, but they are easier to repair and replace because they are small, individual, relatively uniform shape and size, and you can keep a lot more of them as opposed to full sets of breastplates. Um, beauty, form factor, and training. Now, I'm going to get into the higher levels of both light and heavy carapace armor, but just medium armor, which is what I consider heavy flak, uh, heavy flak armor really is gorgeous to me. It's this, uh, you know, concept of chopping up medium-level protection and distributing it over a whole force uh, that just, you know, it keeps them alive. It's really useful for confidence. Uh, it's helpful for to mark out troops that you consider more elite. And what is even better is there's lots of versions of this that you can adopt. The Cadians tend to adopt a very light version uh, because they have to produce for so many different people and they have so many guardsmen they tend to produce more light variants, you know, more on the side of heavy flak as opposed to, like, carapace, or just carapace in general. Uh, and we'll get into carapace in a bit. But in my opinion, it, it's absolutely gorgeous. I really like heavy flak armor. Uh, if I was going to design a regiment and I didn't have access to uh, true carapace armor, I would definitely go with heavy flak. It's so cool to me. And it, since it comes in so many variants and camouflages... Uh, this one is just one of the most famous photos that shows really uh, what the difference is between the light body armor of the Imperium and the medium standard. So, in my opinion, beautiful. Training-wise, all it really does is it goes to units that are expected to storm or be in more enemy fire than, like, average. So, 
it's just built into your training. It's like, all right, we are a heavy, we are a, a medium armor unit. We're a, uh, a, it, it used to be called light carapace. I don't call it that anymore because there's so many things that fall into light carapace now, um, that I've just started calling it heavy flak armor. Uh, and it's still the medium quality. So heavy flak, we're a heavy flak regiment. We're going to be using this armor. So here we get two lovely pieces of carapace armor. And I'm going to be talking a lot about these two pictures. Uh, but, we're going to go into pro and cons real quick. Cost to manufacture. Obviously, uh, sorry, that says light body armor. It should say medium and heavy. I apologize. Uh, medium and heavy. The pros and cons of it. Cost to manufacture. In general, carapace armor is very expensive to manufacture, and that is true carapace, that heavy armor uh, that these two gentlemen are definitely wearing. I would consider both of their outfits to be either full carapace or heavy carapace. Um, the Maccabi and Janissary on the left here, you might be able to argue that he's in Light Carapace, uh, but this Blood Pact or otherwise Cornate Chaos Soldier, he is 100% in Heavy Carapace armor. Now, it is more expensive. It is not as expensive as Power Armor or other personal sets of Powered Armor. Uh, it can still use fairly average materials, uh, it can be coated with steel, uh, it can be made to a lower standard, but in general, it is considerably more expensive to equip an entire regiment with this stuff, uh, and that's why a lot of Imperial agencies, like the Officio Assassinorum and other things, they will equip units with carapace armor, but it will be light carapace. It will be synthetic, or it will be uh, a lighter carapace version, which we will go over in a bit. The difference between light and heavy carapace uh, is really hard to pinpoint, uh, but essentially it, it's just going to be on how thick the armor is, what it's made out of, uh, that kind of stuff. So, flexible uh, with rigid patches or plate armor. So, as mentioned before, that heavy flak, that medium end, uh, that's going to be made with rigid patches, where I have a uniform, and then I have a rig or a webbing set that I'm allowed or I'm able to attach solid armor plates to. Um, now, why do I make that distinction? One, because it makes light carapace and synthetic carapace uh, different from heavy flak armor. Uh, and also because it really differentiates the medium class, that light carapace, that synthetic carapace, uh, and heavy flak from the upper class, which is real carapace and heavy carapace armor. Again, the difference between carapace and heavy carapace we could argue about all day, but what those will consist of is instead of generally being flexible with either rigid patches or little areas uh, that are extra thick or just a material that is highly resistant, uh, like synthetic armor or like the Officio Assassinorum body gloves, uh, those are very tough. We will talk about them in a bit. Um, but I would definitely consider that light carapace. Same thing if I had something like, uh, you know, a coat of plates. Uh, some, like, really heavy flak armor that covers, like, my chest, my body. Something in on par with, like, a, a bomb squad suit. That might still be considered uh, media, uh, light carapace or even heavy flak because it is an external set of armor plates that are woven or rigged onto my normal equipment. Now, plate armor, the heavy carapace and the normal carapace, have this plate armor aesthetic. What do I mean by that? I mean they are flat, overlapping sections of armor plate that are more attached to my body than they are attached to my uniform. So instead of having webbing, instead of having uh, a, a uniform set with like leather and bindings showing, this gentleman over here is a perfect example. You can see very little of his skin. You can see his upper forearm, and that's it. He has a knee joint that attaches directly to a thigh plate, that's attached directly to a boot that's armored, that's attached to a sole of his foot that's armored, and all of that, the thigh plate, it hooks into a skirt made of flak material, or human skin, I can't really tell, it might be both. And then it has a groin piece, and it has a stomach plate, and it has a breast plate, and it has a throat guard, and a fully enclosed helmet, and an armor system, and a, an armor power system, and huge shoulder pads, very thick, like Space Marines, 
uh, armor for their shoulders, massive to protect the throat and the side of the head, and uh, elbow plates and fully armored gauntlets. This is absolutely heavy carapace armor. There's almost no spots in this that I would mark out as weak spots because the protection is covering all of him, and it's all rigid armor. So when I say armor plate style of armor, it means interconnected rigid plates instead of rigid plates sewn onto a flexible or sewn into a flexible material. These plate armor style designs, and you can see here with the Maccabian as well, he's got a gorget, he's got a full Darth Vader style helmet, he's got a, or the, the faceplate of St. Kyodras, I think it is, I might, I might be getting that wrong. Uh, whichever saint they're crying about this day. Uh, he's got a huge shoulder plate. He's got a very thick breastplate that covers all the way down to his waist. His, uh, you know, skirt here is made out of flak material. There's no real weak spots in this design. He's got armored uh, housings on his arms. And all of this just screams carapace armor. It's so thick. It's heavy. It's clearly not just a flak plate. There's steel on the outside. There's steel on the outside. There's clearly this thick material behind it covering his chest. It makes them look bulky. It makes them look sizable. That's how I separate heavy flak and light carapace from genuine heavy carapace and carapace. Uh, and then finally, variable protection. So, storm, shock, and assault. These three are the ones that I think use either uh, heavy flak, light carapace. Light carapace is rarer in the Imperial Guard. It is more common with uh, Arbites, uh, Inquisitorial Agents, uh, other units like that that tend to be somewhat, you know, elite and capable of buying unique or custom armor. Uh, and Assault. So when I say Storm, Shock, or Assault, those are units that are expected to go into heavy enemy fire. So you might say, well, oh, they're all expected to go into enemy, heavy enemy fire. They're expected to go into heavy enemy fire where other units would not survive. <laughs> uh, and they're supposed to win through and continue operations. So they're line breaker units. They're designed for siege, for storming enemy complexes. Uh, and this can be very low armored regiments. You know, like the Krieg, the Kriegsmen who wear carapace armor, which, my god, it is the most, it is one of the most cut down versions of heavy flak that I've ever seen. They call it carapace armor. In my opinion, it is absolutely not carapace armor. It is, it is heavy flak at best. But considering that the average Krieg guardsman wears no body armor whatsoever, at least having heavy flak makes you feel less like a human sacrifice, you know, if you cared about with that kind of thing, which the Kriegsmen do not. Uh, and then that's all on one side, that light carapace, that full flak on that storm shock assault, you know, that's their role. Then you have heavy infantry. Now, heavy infantry aren't just going to be used for one thing. They're not just going to be used as storm units, as shock units, as assault. Heavy infantry are almost always going to be used in conjunction with other elite units. So heavy is the absolute elite of the Imperial Infantry. They will have mechanization. They will have motorization. They will be in full carapace. They will have hell guns. They are essentially about as elite as the Imperial Infantry will get before you get to Tempestus Scions. So there's a bunch of these. Some people consider the Kriegsmen to be a part of them. I only classify heavy regiments as regiments that use vehicles in conjunction with carapace armor, whether it's heavy or normal, uh, or even theoretically light. But still, when you want to separate these armors between medium and heavy, on one side you're going to have all the storm, shock, and assault guys, you know, the one-trick ponies who are expected to boil through enemy defenses, make a hole, and then let other regiments come through. And then you have the all-around elites, which are the heavy regiments. And the difference is just going to be lighter protection on one side, much heavier protection, and heavier armament on the other side. So, heavy carapace is going to go to heavy units. Uh, storm shock and assault are going to have to make do with either light carapace or uh, with heavy flak. Uh, finally, yeah. So, I separate them out like this. Heavy flak, which is what we've gone over, 
Light Carapace or Synthetic. We'll get to that in a second when we talk about the Arbitase and the Inquisition. Light Carapace and Synthetic, and then Heavy Carapace. You could theoretically, again, separate uh, you know, Carapace armor from Heavy Carapace armor, but at that point, it's just being pedantic, because the whole point of Heavy Carapace is that it will save your life from things that are, you know, big and nasty, like bolt guns, or heavy energy weapons, or much larger explosions, or any number of things that normal armor couldn't deal with. Heavy carapace is designed to do that. So, again, I consider this, uh, in order cost of manufacturers, definitely a con, flexible with rigid patches. I call that a, a neutral. Variable protection, I definitely call that a plus. That's definitely a perk of this, is that you can definitely divide who's doing what job based on what armor they have. And then finally, we have our little classification down here. Uh, so, let's talk standards for a second. Uh, I'm, I'm going to maybe ignore this side over here, other than a quick overview. So, who makes what? Almost always, this is going to be made, uh, you know, the medium armor is going to be made on worlds uh, that are not so industrial. They might take pieces or sections from the uh, Mechanicus, but in general, they can if they can make flak armor, they can make heavy flak. It's not that much difference. Uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, but for almost all the other stuff, especially for the more technological armors like heavy carapace and uh, light carapace as well, you know, you might think light carapace is easier to make. In reality, it's actually a little bit harder uh, sometimes, depending on the design. Uh, and, you know, that's just going to be split up. Licensed production, a lot of heavy carapace gets licensed out, uh, but in general, it's two war worlds who already produce heavy infantry regiments. So, you know, if a... War World makes uh, heavy infantry regiments that use uh, heavy carapace, they're not going to want to buy all of those suits new made from a Forge World. They have the industry, they'll want to make it themselves. And uh, often you will see that be the case. Innovation and degradation. So this is where we get to one of the fun things. Obviously, heavy carapace has all kinds of cool gubbins. Uh, from this gentleman right down here to just the, ten uh, the Tempest, the Scions, and their crazy stuff. Uh, one of the great things that I love about body armor is that you can always boil it down to what does it look like in the medieval era. <laughs> um, medium body armor in 40k can technically be full plate armor from, like, the gothic period of our own history. If you have, you know thick metal armor that's like 5 to 6 millimeters and then 10 millimeters on the chest and head, congratulations, you officially have medium body armor by the standards of the Imperial Guard. Even though you look like a medieval knight straight out of history, you are technically in some of the best body armor that the Imperial Guard can realistically get their hands on. Uh, you know, feral worlds can sometimes have this, or feudal worlds more commonly, it'll be like, ah, oh, yes... All of our PDF are, like, knights, and they're in shining armor. And it's like, okay, well, congrats. You're now technically an Imperial Guard Regiment. We're calling you up and uh, enjoy your your uh, storm assault roll with your lances. You know, just a funny thing, but in theory that can happen. Uh, on the really heavy side, sometimes Chaos Lords will get their hands on really heavy plate armor. Uh, this happens more in Warhammer Fantasy than 40k, but it isn't an impossible strategy in 40k. If you have someone who's very strong, you can make double or triple thick steel armor for them, and it will still be steel armor. It's still going to protect you from bullets, uh, you know, at a certain range, uh, and if it's not super special. But, you know, if I'm carrying a, a 20 millimeter plate on my chest of steel armor that's been, you know, heat treated and protected... I'm going to laugh off low-caliber autogun rounds and pretty much shrug off a couple of las blasts as well. And if that's the best that my uh, Chaos Beholden f uh, Feudal World can produce for me as a demagogue or some other sort of Chaos Leader, I'm definitely happy with it because it means that I'm going to get to fight to live another day, uh, whereas the poor schmucks next to me might not get a chance. Uh, but again, as opposed to the light body armor, which is just meant to save your life, Medium and heavy are meant to fight on. So, you're meant to get hit, keep hitting back, continue fighting. It will save your life multiple times. It's meant to be more reliably capable of keeping you alive, even when under heavy fire. Uh, and that's the same thing. Relative protection, it doesn't just save your life. So, light body armor just saves your life. Gives you a second chance. Lets you get up after a hit. 
medium body armor, it's supposed to protect you from getting really badly injured. So, you know, if I get shot in the legs and I'm wearing light uh, armor, if I'm wearing light body armor, a flak vest, I'm still going to be wounded. I'm going to be out of the fight. I'm going to be severely wounded. My leg is bleeding. I have a bullet in it. I need to get pulled back behind the line, and some doc needs to rip that out of my leg. If I get las blasted in the leg, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, it, it burns. The pain. Ow. I'm I'm done. I ain't fighting no more. I'm My leg don't work. But with uh, light, with heavy flak armor and with light carapace and and heavy carapace especially, a hit to the leg, hit to the waist, hit to the arms, shoulders, I'm not going to have a problem with it. It's not going to hurt me. Uh, and while it might damage the uh, overall protectiveness of my armor, I'm not going to have to get pulled out of the fight. Because, you know, every time that a guardsman gets wounded, he's not just taking himself out of the fight. He's taking out another soldier, maybe two, who has to carry him. So one of the great things about medium and heavy body armor is that you can stay in the fight for longer because your men aren't getting wounded as often. So... Let's go through it here again. This is a lovely outline of, here's your helmet with your fully enclosed visor, your head, your respirator. Respirators aren't uncommon in the Imperial Guard. At least most regiments will have a way to protect against uh, chemical gas threats. Uh, sometimes it's very rudimentary, and sometimes it's very complicated, like these lovely respirators. Uh, big shoulder pads, as I mentioned with the, the heavy flak. This is all one piece. Uh, but you could probably separate these shoulder pads out. Uh, this one has a nice, uh, like, lower torso protector. But in general, again, this is just going to be covering your upper chest, and there's a thin band of open waist. Gauntlets, as previously mentioned, that little armored skirt. And then one, two, three pieces of leg armor covering your upper thigh, knee, and shin, letting you articulate, run, crouch, all that kind of stuff without too much interference. So this is still very light and flexible. Then we get to this intermediate one here, and I have our very angry-looking Arbite here. He's got a very thick helmet. Generally, he'd have a visor. I think they're just doing that in the art so that he looks more scary, which is reasonable. Um... He's got a respirator and probably a Vox caster in there as well, so he can scream at people. Uh, but then you notice something weird. Why does he have a giant ornate coat over his whole body? You know, that's not really... That doesn't look like protection. Oh, nay, nay. Oh, contraire. These shoulder pads prove that it is protection. Or at least it implies it. He has gauntlets. He has armored toes. You can see this little scalloped section. Uh, it's covering steel. It's steel armor. This entire uniform underneath here is flak material. He has a breastplate that covers down to his waist, and this outer coat is also made of heavy, thick flak material. So this is very much indicative of what I say when I say synthetic armor. It is not really rigid or hard, and that is the same thing with light carapace. It's not going to be as rigid as heavy carapace, but it's still way more protective, because look at him. He has the breastplate of the heavy flak armor, and the shoulder pads, and the helmet. So that, in and of itself, already makes him better protected than the average guardsman. And in addition to that, he has a thick buff coat underneath it, and, you know, leggings, as the guardsman does. But look, he's got an extra layer of flexible protection. He's got a thick overcoat, which is made of flak material. You might, you might say, you know, an overcoat's not going to protect you from bullets. Au contraire. The overcoat isn't meant to protect him from bullets. The overcoat is meant to slow down any impacts that are coming towards him. Why would that matter? He's got no other armor. It's hidden. The armor that he's wearing is hidden. Which means, you know, the terrifying thing with the Arbites is they always look scary. And the reason that he looks so scary is, what if you shoot this guy in the thigh? And you might think he's got no protection there, just a coat. Well, your bullet gets slowed down by the overcoat, and then if you look really close here, he's got a plate of steel on his thigh, on his outer thigh and leg. He is armored under there. He's armored on his thighs, on his shins. You can see it there. You can see his feet. So he essentially has all that the heavy flak armor has, plus an entire other layer of thick Kevlar over his whole body. And he's no more restricted than the Imperial Guardsman who's in this. Granted, this armor is probably more expensive. Uh, you can see how ornate it is. You can see how his weapons are designed for like close combat riot control. But look at him. Look at his helmet. It's thick. It's made of steel. His shoulder plaid's made of steel. His breastplate, steel. It's this very heavy, very thick materials. And it's all meant to 
prevent him from taking damage like the heavy uh, like the heavy flak is, but he has more mobility or he is at least on par mobility. So that's the idea of the heavy carapace is it provides you an extra layer of all round protection in exchange for not making you suffer as much in terms of mobility. So kind of this sneaky picture that has all these extra little details that you really need to analyze. I think I've gone over it pretty well because I've looked at this guy maybe a hundred times and I noticed something new about his uniform and his armor every time. Uh, and then finally, heavy carapace. One of, in my opinion, the most beautiful types of protection in the Imperium of Man. Look at his chest. I'm just going to analyze this entire right now. Look at his head. He's got a full helmet. He's got an a little light system that might be a targeter. He's got his backpack power pack to support his suite of his helmet and his electronics on his arm uh, bands. And he's also got what looks like either a flamer or a hell gun back there. So that might be a, a flamer tank. But either way, then he's got huge. This looks like almost double size, uh, you know, closer in size to the light carapace armor shoulder pads as opposed to the heavy flax shoulder pads. Look at his chest. This looks like a briefcase got clothes on his body. That is rigid. It's thick. It's a thick ceramite coating, almost a slab of it. You can see even again here, the lower torso, the gut plate, is even bigger for him, covering more of his torso with that flexible flak material underneath all of it. But this is obviously what I mean when I say that stuff isn't just hooked to his flak armor. That's a full set of protection right there, all in one piece. And he's got a gorget covering his throat, which the heavy flak doesn't have. It covers all the way up to his helmet. If he hunched his shoulders, he'd be practically immune to small arms from the, you know, from the navel up. And even his elbows, while they're exposed, look at the chunky size of these gauntlets. If you're shooting at him from the front with his weapon aimed towards you, you're likely to hit the flared edge of those instead of actually hitting his elbow where you might be aiming. His waist girdle, again, is this huge, thick, much thicker than these, or at least visibly they might be, and then they are wide, they hang down. Uh, they're really hooked up to his shoulders as opposed to this is like a belt. Uh, and then finally, he's got wide thigh pads, covers much more of the thigh. You can see it almost goes all the way around to his hip over here, whereas this thigh pad really only covers the front of the thigh. Uh, he's got the kind of the same pointed or angled, almost like a cheese wedge style knee protectors. And then he's got armored boots, which the Imperial Guardsman doesn't have. And he's got a two-piece. Look at this. He's got armor on the back of his calf and armor on the front of his calf. Almost like, uh, if you've ever seen, like, horseshoes, uh, the ones that they actually use to, like, protect their uh, shins from damage, it's almost like that, like a two-piece armor system that completely supports and encapsulates his uh, lower calf. This is so much protection. There are very few locations on this man that are not downright immune to small arms fire. And that's really the main hitting point with Heavy Carapace is you're practically protected from almost anything. And of course, his breastplate is going to be thicker. His arm plates are going to be thicker. His shoulders are going to be thicker than even heavy flak armor. And if you got hit with a bolt gun, if you got hit with a hell gun, if you got hit with, you know, orc, uh, a heavy stubber, a small autocannon, all of these are going to be something that would probably kill someone in light carapace if it was a direct hit. Would probably kill somebody in heavy flak armor if it was a direct hit. But if you're lucky with heavy carapace, you might walk away with your life from something big and nasty hitting you like that. And even more, you have a very good chance of surviving, maybe even without a scratch, if it's not a direct hit. If it slides along your armor, if it hits your shoulder pad, if it hits at an angle, or if it's a bad round or it detonates on your armor. That's the kind of thing that heavy carapace can do for you that the other two cannot. So... Finishing up here with importance and logistics. This is a complicated photo, but it has a lot of really good stuff in it that I'm going to highlight. Uh, one of it is our two guys who are going to be the focus here are the ones up in front. Melt a gun and what looks like a hotshot las gun. Looks like he's, you know, firing away there with a the hotshot. Uh, and then there's all these cultists around them and a chaos space marine. Looks like Black Legion. Might not be. Not sure. These two are going to be our focus. So, for the PDF they will almost never get this, unless it's the primitive and heavy types that we talked about. Uh, remember that, like, uh, you know, a, a feudal world might have an army that's covered entirely in steel protection. 
congrats. By the rules of this system, you technically have light carapace armor or heavy flak armor. Great. Uh, but in general, the PDF, they'll never get their hands on this. Chaos. This is really the big one. Full flak is not unreasonable for a cultist to get their hands on. Now you might say, well, why? Not a lot of people have it. That's not the point. The point is not that not a lot of people have it. It's more the fact that you don't have to kill a man in full flak to get full flak. You just have to kill a couple men in standard flak. What does that mean? Well, very simply, flak armor is flak armor, no matter where I take it from. If I kill two people who have flak armor on them, I have got two flak vests, two shoulder pads, and two helmets. You know, if none of them are damaged, and even if they're damaged, I'm still going to reuse them. I'm a chaos cultist, or a traitor guardsman, whatever it may be. I can chop that breastplate into fours, and I can use it to protect my thighs and to protect my calves. I can take his shoulder pads and use them to double up my shoulder pads, as I believe these two gentlemen have done. Their shoulder pads are very wide, uh, much thicker than average. I think that they've taken a standard Imperial Guard shoulder plate and stretched it, and this is very much something you can do with tough, durable Kevlar, uh, is you can flex it out and widen it, and you can see how they're fighting. They're fighting like spaceries, with a shoulder down forward, protecting their neck, protecting their breastplate, you know, covering their vulnerable spots while they're firing, and that wider, thicker pad there implies to me that that has been enhanced in some way, whether it's uh, by taking a piece of flak armor and stretching it and putting it over a piece of steel armor to create something of the equivalent of carapace armor, or whatever it may be. You know, th- this is just something that you can get from a lot of this artwork. Um, then primitive armor, obviously, much like the PDF, Chaos will have a chance to, you know, take on a lot of feral worlds. They might have one that has a traditional industry of making full plate armor. Congrats, you are now equipped to the equivalent of a storm or assault regiment as an imperial, uh, as a chaos cultist. Uh, so that primitive armor you will also see sometimes, you know, that uh, full plate armor that is of an archaic mode, but it is still very capable if you, you know, up the thickness of protecting you from threats. The same way that light carapace armor, if it's on the high end, uh, if it's on the really high end, uh, we'll talk about, you know, that maybe being something that, uh, you know, a demagogue might get him, his hands on, like, you know, some super massive, insanely heavy set of, uh, you know, archaic armor and be like, ah, yes, I'm in heavy carapace armor, even though he can barely move. Um, but still, most of the time that, you know, archaic armor is going to be on the full flak side, occasionally, or going to be on the heavy flak side, occasionally it'll be on the light carapace side, if it's very good. Uh, and heavy. Heavy carapace is very rare. Sometimes it's made, as I mentioned, you know, you don't have to kill a man in heavy heavy carapace to get heavy carapace. I don't have to kill a man in full flak to get full flak, uh, in heavy flak to get full flak, heavy flak, excuse me. So, scrounging, uh, modification, uh, mismatching of metal armor armor pieces with ceramite covered, or putting ceramite coverings on other things, you know, hacking up a space marine who might have been killed by your... Uh, your cult, and chopping his armor into little bits, and, you know, ripping it off, chopping it into pieces. Absolutely, once you absolutely destroy the Marine's body and you take all the armor, if you're not keeping the armor for some sort of Chaos Space Marine Master, you want to chop it up and start using it to protect yourself. If I can make a gauntlet or a greave out of a Space Marine's arm plate, you know, it might be a bit big, But it's going to give me insane protection. A breastplate from a space marine can probably make, uh, you know, body armor for six different normal-sized people. uh, And it's going to be the equivalent or superior to even light carapace armor, just because it's thick ceramite. You know, look at this gentleman. He's got huge sets of armor. Now, he might be in some sort of modified Terminator armor, especially I'm seeing because of the doubled-up shoulder plates. Uh, But... Then again, this might just be some very archaic or uh, some add-ons to his armor. More common with Chaos Space Marines, but not unheard of with normal Space Marines. And taking apart their armor, a very good way to get heavy carapace armor. And heavy carapace armor in uh, Chaos Forces 
are almost always going to be signifiers of the elite. And this is where I come back to the photo again. These two, look at them. Look at the people around them for just a second. No helmets. No real protection. You don't see great body armor. You see, you know, rags, little pieces of it. He looks like he's in primitive armor. He's got a spear or a cleaver. Uh, for Chaos Space Marines, they value some cultists and traitor guardsmen higher than others. And even in a traitor guard regiment or in a cult, the elites are going to be the ones who get the body armor because they're also expected to use better weapons. Look at their weapons again. Spears, swords, you know, crappy auto guns, huge archaic melee weapons, and then the Chaos Space Marine has a bolt gun and a chainsword. Look what they're using that sets them apart. You have a melta gun and what looks like a hotshot las gun or even just a las gun marks them as the elite and this gentleman has actually some poles with some skulls marking uh you know success rates he's a lieutenant or some other type of leader he's got some gnarly mutations but either way also one of the great things is look at the side of this guy's helmet he's got ripped out wiring from what was clearly a targeter unit you know probably cannibalized by the chaos space marine behind him so that he can uh put that unit back into his non-functional helmet that hasn't worked in 500 years so again when you get it in a Chaos uh, Warband or in a Cult, the heavy carapace is going to go to the heavy hitters. It's going to go to the people who, you know, you know, Steve, he knows how to use a plasma gun. And that's why he's using the heavy carapace armor, because we can't have a random stray bullet kill Steve, because Steve needs to use the plasma gun. And you can't just pick up and use the plasma gun, because you're not Steve. Steve is him, in other words, which is what you'll see with the heavy carapace guys. They are him. Uh, for the for the Blood Pact, this is the Death Brigade. Uh, for the Vraxians, this is the Cardinal's uh, Honor Guard, the Disciples of Zaphon. Uh, for the Severin Dominant, one of my favorites, the Severin Dominant have their own elite Guardians of Duke Severus. These uh, elite carapace armored, hell gun using uh, shock infantry. I love them to death. They are gorgeous. Uh, please look up the art for them. It's so cool. I didn't include it in this because uh, it's too pretty, but still, look them up. Finally, moving on. Guardsmen. Again, you have Assault, Heavy, and Scions. I've already talked about Assault and Heavy, so let's, let's talk Scions real quick. Scions, they use the absolute full-on heaviest version of heavy carapace. Their breastplates are thick. Their shoulder plates are enormous. They have lots of extra gubbins and add-ons. They all use hell guns, and they have integrated power packs, integrated oxygen, integrated targeters and sights. They have helmet aspects. They have great communication. And all of it is streamlined and perfected in a way that almost no other regiment will ever be able to afford. It is so beyond expensive for Scions to get their gear, and it's done for a reason. They're trained to an insane level. They're expected to use that gear to the highest possible level at all times. Which is why they're so rare. You might say, well, this is a lot of Scion regiments. They're all over the place. In terms of numbers, Scion regiments are never going to be as big as Imperial Guard ones in general, especially for infantry. And also, Scions are expected to punch way above their weight. Scions are expected to be able to deal with almost every threat. They're supposed to be able to deal with light and medium vehicles, which infantry can't normally do. They're expected to be able to deal with Chaos Space Marines, which you would almost expect no Imperial Guard Regiment to be able to do unless they're fully armored with tanks. You know... They're expected to go in the way of threats or, more importantly, to enter areas where the Imperial Guard don't know what the threat may be. So, because Scions deploy via aircraft most often, and when they don't, they deploy, they deploy via light to medium vehicles uh, with, you know, support equipment, but they don't really tote along with them a lot of heavy weapons like the Guard do. Uh, the heavy weapons that they have are mostly technological, and they're mostly geared towards their one big weakness, which is anti-armor. Uh, essentially, because all of their weapons are hell guns, the only real problem that they're going to have with body armor is when it's on a tank. So, the weapons that they tend to bring, Melta, Plasma, heavy hell guns, essentially, with the hotshot volley gun, that's all to deal with light, medium, and, to a degree, heavy vehicles. Um, so, that's the deal with Scions. They, they use it 
uh, ubiquitously. They're expected to go into super, you know, unstable war zones where they may face any number of enemies that a regular Imperial Guard Regiment wouldn't be expected to. Uh, and because of the expense, they are specially trained and they are provided for, you know, specifically to do this job. They are Space Marines when Space Marines aren't available. Basically, that's their job. Now, we move on to the kind of long list of people who canonically use this armor, but we don't see it very often. Um, that's that's what I'm going to call this. Arbites, as mentioned, they use this. Some of them use a synth black material, uh, similar to how Imperial Assassins go. Uh, this synth material, like the heavy cloak that that guy was wearing, that is a very advanced form of of flak weave essentially it works to be it works out to be the equivalent protection of the chest on a standard flak plate but it covers every inch of your body and of course like the arbites in our previous thing we saw that that wasn't the only level of protection he had he had a breastplate he had uh plates that go on it We'll see that with Arbites a lot, while they have like a steel protective piece or something that's obviously armor, but it's surrounded and shrouded or underpinned by the equivalent of a, you know, a non-ballistic, you know, not a rigid, but a thinner but still protective armor piece. Uh, a body glove is often the phrase for it, but... This is different with Imperial Assassins. They can't afford to have those big, obvious pieces of armor like the Arbites have, so they prefer to just have the smooth undercoat that is the body glove, the synth body glove. And they call it synth body glove all the time, but in reality, I think it's just a thick flak weave with maybe some synthetic materials woven into it. And of course, you can make flak weave entirely out of synthetic materials. Uh, modern Kevlar is often made entirely from synthetic materials. Uh, and as a result, theirs is going to be of higher quality, of higher thickness, but for all that extra protection that it has, you know, equivalent to the light armor of the Imperium, or even the medium armor, you know, the breastplate, but over your whole body. So it can stop uh, standard infantry weapons, uh, it can slow down, you know, melee attacks, it can prevent you from losing your life, because Imperial Assassins are expected to go into war zones and bad things can happen there. Even if they're not supposed to be engaging in conflict directly, uh, they still need some sort of insurance that a stray round or a random stab in the back isn't going to kill a very expensive Imperial Assassin. And what is worse, ruin their cover by an accidental death. Uh, you know, Imperial Assassins are supposed to come, go, and nobody knew they were there. <laughs> Or come, go, and everyone knew they were there in the case of the Eversaur, which is one of the reasons why the Eversaur will often be seen with extra armor. Yes, the Eversaur will sometimes have uh, either a steel breastplate, uh, he obviously has his helmet, uh, which, like most of the other helmets, is more protective than just his body glove. Uh, that's not really true with the Vindicar or the uh, Calidus. But it is true of most of the others, and especially the Eversaur. That steel faceplate is not just for scare tactics. That is absolutely to prevent someone from shooting him in the head, and that just killing him. Uh, and then, of course, he'll have elbow plates and knee plates and thigh plates. Uh, these are occasional in the art, but they're mainly for the fact that the Eversaur is so darn fast and hopped up on so many narcotics that he can't really feel pain. Uh, and the whole goal is just to have him come in and deal damage. So, Imperial Assassins. Space Marines, they really use the absolute heaviest version of Carapace that, you know, similar to Scions, that powered, that separate, private, air supply, pressurized, capable of, you know, resisting all types of things. It's got uh, protection in terms of, super, of heavy Carapace uh, are equivalent to light body armor. Or, uh, uh, sorry, light power armor. But the difference between light power armor and super heavy carapace or heavy carapace is kind of blurry. When you get above Scion level, you get into what Space Marines will use. Now, it is inferior to power armor because it doesn't provide you with a lot of extra protection. Uh, it doesn't have the black carapace, which is almost like another layer of protection even under the armor. Um... And it also, you know, is less in tune with the Marine's body, because unlike true power armor, it's not hooked up to his brain or attached to his skin via the black carapace. Uh, you know, we'll go into that when we get to power armor. Uh, bolters first, then power armor, I promise. We're, we're going that way. Um, but they do use it. The other ones that use it is when Inquisitors aren't using power armor, 
and they're going into combat, they will almost always have heavy carapace. Now, this comes in a variety of ways, but almost never will you see an Inquisitor in anything less than light carapace armor. Even if they're in a diplomatic situation, because Inquisitors tend to be very paranoid, and they like to present the idea that they are military as opposed to just witch hunters, they will often show up in specialty-made, custom, beautiful light carapace, or sorry, uh, light carapace or synth carapace, or even heavy carapace armor to show off, essentially. You know, this is me, look at my giant shoulder pads, look at my uh, rosette that I've hung off the front of it, uh, and some of it is downright archaic. Some Inquisitors wear steel armor over their things, like a knight or like a, an ancient feudal lord, uh, but in reality, that is the equivalent of light carapace. Uh, and that's even more examples of like, hey, primitive armor isn't just garbage, it's actually better than some of the light armor that the guardsmen use. Um, but yeah, Inquisitors use it all the time. They will almost never show up, uh, whether it's to a scrap or to a meeting, in anything less than uh, light carapace, unless they're very comfortable and they're you know far away from a war zone. If they're in like a diplomatic meeting and it doesn't call for that type of armor, they might not wear it. But even in you know video games like Space Marine, Space Marine One, for example, the Inquisitor in that he's wearing a version of light carapace armor. You can see he's got a thick outer coat, he's got an interior breastplate, uh, he had a lot of augmetics that covered his hands and stuff, you know, you don't need to armor up augmetics as much because it could interfere with the with the equipment, but it might also, you know, not protect them or cause shock damage to them, which could ruin them. Uh, but yeah, very cool. I love looking at an Inquisitor armor because it's essentially just one of the few examples we have of light carapace being used almost all the time. Uh, and then finally, Xenos. I, again, I'm not focusing on aliens as much, uh, because Xenos are not really uh, a focus of the channel initially. We will go into it. I know, Xenos people, like the Mechanicus guys, you're just going to have to wait. GW's been, GW's been keeping you waiting for models for like 30 years. I'm sure you can wait a couple of months at the pace that I'm going. You won't have to even wait that long. But yeah, just the Eldar and the Dark Eldar almost universally use light carapace. For the Dark Elder, it tends to be more light carapace, and for the Eldar, it tends to be more heavy carapace. Now, their lighter units, the ones that are not uh, so much straight-up combat units, you know, not striking scorpions or aspect warriors or that kind of thing, they will have lighter carapace, more flexible, more mobile for their long, willowy bodies, but the really heavy guys, the guys who are in melee combat, who are, you know, going out, uh, claw to chain sword with chaos with a uh, space marines those guys are going to be in heavy carapace now it is still you know it's still eldar design so it's lighter it's designed for speed uh, it's not designed to just tank rounds like certain types of heavy carapace armor are like the like the chaos uh carapace armor that's like layered and thicker and designed you know ad hoc so to speak the Eldar is very much designed to augment their combat capability while keeping an unlucky round from taking their head off, even if that round is something out of a bolt gun or something of that nature. Again, direct shots with a bolt gun to heavy carapace armor really is a toss-up. You don't want to be under bolter fire, but if it is not a straight-up shot, if I'm shooting and I hit somebody in the shoulder with a bolt gun, or if I hit him in the chest at an angle... The penetration of the bolt gun is based on the tip striking directly and being able to bore its way through the armor with its weight. The rocket-propelled nature of the bolt gun means that if it strikes and skips, or strikes and bounces, because it doesn't have a cap, because it can't really deform, because the head is so hard, it can deflect much more easily from a rigid plate. Which is why sometimes you'll see, like, uh, you know, it doesn't happen as much because the bolter is so mythos and special, but... It can happen that the bolt will ricochet, or crack and bounce, or it will bury itself, detonate, and not detonate on the person, but detonate in the thicker part of their armor. This will happen with shoulders, things like that, and where a bolt gun would have killed somebody with less protection, it will just injure them, or wound them, or, you know, with the god emperor or the dark god's luck, it will bounce off and miss entirely. You know, not a straight up shot. But if I'm firing with a bolt gun and I'm not taking too much time, if I'm maybe firing full auto into a crowd, there's a good chance that I will hit somebody who's in heavy carapace armor 
and it's not going to kill them, especially if it's good. Um, and they might actually come and kill me after. Uh, so, finally, Dark Eldar. They have the lighter stuff, and I've not seen, to my knowledge, anything heavier than Light Carapace. Their stuff tends to be very flexible, very piratical, and some of them just don't wear body armor at all. I'm looking at you, witches, and also racks, and also most of your named characters and other units. I don't have a high opinion of Dark Eldar, as much as I love their lore, weapons, and aesthetic. Their combat power is based on raiding. That's what I'll say. I'll, I'll say the nice thing and say that it is raiding-based. So... That is all that we have for today. That took a lot longer than I expected. I'm sorry. It's going to take a few days for the Bolter video, but that is the one that is coming out next. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to kind of take a breather to let you guys tell me what you want to hear. Uh, I had somebody recommend to me that I do Soldier's Kit. You know, I've done Body Armor. Now I should do Kit uh, and Equipment, and I'm, I'm on board with that. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, but after I do Bolters, it might be someone's wish that I go do Space Marine Power Armor. And that's good. I can go do that, disambiguate it, go over it. Uh, I'm going to change up the format for a lot of these. You know, these are just the intro videos. They're basic. They take a long time. They're covering a lot of concepts that I want to hammer into people's heads so that I can repeatedly say them out loud and people won't be like, well, wait, what does he mean about that? How does that work? What is that comparison? That's what this is for. This is laying the groundwork as mentioned. So... I might go into Power Armor next, might go into Terminators, might start going into Vehicles, but what I also want to hit before I leave weapons altogether is uh, melee weapons. And that will be a long video. Probably I'm going to split it up between Primitive, Chain, and Power. Uh, especially Power, because there's a lot of people who have issues with what a Power Weapon is. Uh, and I, I, I might go into Demons in the Warp the other time, you know, I try to avoid the Chaos stuff because it has less of an audience, even though it is my preferred faction. Uh, but, you know, I don't have to hold on to that, or hold off on that. If there's a lot of people who like Chaos, I will absolutely go into Chaos Theology, factions, uh, the logistics of Chaos. But the other thing is logistics, both of the Imperium and of Chaos and of other factions. I'd love to go into that. Supply, demand, production, all of that stuff really gets me going, so... Any time that you guys want to make a success suggestion, I'd really appreciate it. But for the moment, I wish you all a lovely good night.